Welcome, everybody. Miles Kessler here, and we're having our uh, MFA alumni meeting. Uh, we have a great group of people who are. Some of you were in last year's Meditation for Aikidoka course. Some of you were in the year before's Meditation for Aikidoka course. And some of you were in the course of the year before that. And some of you were in either two or three years worth of course. I don't know, but uh, it's good to Aline. Yeah, Matthias. Yeah, everybody's uh, done this once or twice two times around, three times around. And, and I thought uh, what I'd talk about today is something appropriate since you're all kind of meditators and you've been through this, uh, this, this training a few times. I thought I would talk about internalizing the practice. And, you know, I, my first experience, and in, in actually to be fair, my first struggle with internalizing my practice was with Aikido. And I used to, re I, I mean, I, as a kid, I was kind of, I love sports, so I'd be out there playing, and, and, and I love team sports, so I love the discipline and everything that went along with that. But then when I was off, man, I was off. I would go from extreme discipline to extreme lazy. You know, that was, that in my youth, that there was a lot of that. Extreme discipline, extreme lazy, extreme uh, pro productive and developing, and extremely like nothing happening. And then as I became more of an adult, that balanced out a little bit, but I used to notice, and I used to struggle quite a bit of, feeling like, um, gee, you know, when I'm engaged with a, with, a, with a coach or a teacher or a team or a structure, I'm just like developing. But as soon as I get out of that structure, I fall apart and it just, nothing happens. And, um, and I didn't think of, I didn't even think about, inter, in, you know, having internalized and not internalized the, the, the practice. I wasn't thinking along those lines, but it was a struggle. I certainly suffered from that. And, um, and then, you know, I went through my life and, and eventually I started Aikido and I loved Aikido and I was always, there was a structure that I loved and I just kept going and I was, I was training uh, quite a bit, even from the very beginning, I was training a lot, like five days a week. And after three years, I went to Japan and then in the fourth year, I moved to Japan and I was in a structure and I remember in Iwama Dojo, I, I, since I found a good job, well, I was teaching English um and it was a, it was it was good job it was good it was good money so i could teach 15 hours a week and still support my life to do aikido full time um i i decided to stay for more than a year i went there for a year but i ended up staying uh, as i guess as many of you know i ended up staying eight years in total but the second third year i was in and i loved it that was my home and um and people used to say how long are you gonna stay i said i don't know i'm gonna stay as long as i you know i can stay the rest of my life i'm gonna stay as long as i need to stay i was just i was just loving it and then i would reflect on my aikido and i would always think well you know i'm training every day uh, maybe one day off a week i'm training every day and i'm developing and i knew that if i if i left you know, if i left that structure that intense structure that my aikido would go like that it would go back down i knew it because it wasn't internalized yet. Again, I wasn't thinking on those levels, but it wasn't internalized. I knew that my Aikido would go down. So I trained, trained, trained. I told myself at one point, I'm not going to leave until I feel like when I leave, my Aikido won't go down. It'll, I'll continue to develop. And I was training full time, about 20 hours a week in a, in a, in a pretty high level, high standard dojo, high level uh, training, high level teacher, etc. cetera. Uh, it took me five years of that intensive training before I felt like, okay, now I can leave and my, my development won't go down. It'll just continue to develop. And that was kind of a tipping point for, you know, for me in that art, for me in that art, I feel like that was the tipping point where it began to become internalized. It still wasn't fully internalized, but it began to become internalized. And uh, I stayed for another, ended up staying for another three years before I left. And by the time I left, I felt like, I felt like it was internalized. In fact, I was starting to feel the limitations of that traditional Japanese context that I was in and that traditional kind of, uh, there, was a, there was a tendency towards dog, being dogmatic in the style and, and whatever. So I was running into those limitations. So I went and my Aikido just kept growing. And you know, I didn't need to be training on the mat every day to, to, to experience the growing. But then I did the same thing with meditation. And I was, you know, I, I started meditating when, when I was in Japan, kind of on my own. 
no no form no formal teachings no teacher but i was practicing but it was always it was like that it, it was not internalized at all if i if i kept up the discipline the, the the meditation would grow if i stopped the discipline the meditation would just disappear and um i had that same feeling and for the longest time i felt like my meditation practice and my aikido practice were parallel paths that they weren't integrating at all it took several years before they started to integrate and it was the same thing with the feeling of, I, of meditation in my life, that it wasn't really having an impact in my life. Sure, it was making more calm and more stable and I could clear my mind, but it was still dependent on my discipline in meditation. And then when I finally found my way to Burma <clears throat> and I talked to my teacher, Pandita, I kind of asked him a question that was, it was, it was a little bit different question. I was asking him, you know, what makes a person Buddhist? Because I went to Japan, I became Japanese. Some of you heard this story before, probably. I won't go into the whole thing, but I, I went to Japan and I kind of took on Japanese culture. It was, and it was not me. I was kind of, I loved the Japanese culture. And in a way, in some ways, I was like pretending to be Japanese. You do that when you learn a language, when you learn the culture, you just kind of take it on. But it wasn't authentically me. It was a good way to learn. But eventually, I had to let that go. And when I went to Buddhism, I knew that I wasn't interested in doing that. I just wanted to get the practice. And Upadita told me that, you know, there's many people that are in Buddhist in name only, but they're not real Buddhists because they haven't seen the Dharma. They haven't seen the inner, they haven't come into contact with the inner, um, the inner uh, uh, ultimate reality of the practice. <clears throat> so so he, he said that to, to when you see the Dharma, you actually see the Buddha. When you see that, and then and only, so he basically said, when you see the Dharma, then you're a Buddhist. You're, you're a real Buddhist, not a Buddhist in name, not a Buddhist in culture, not a Buddhist in belief and following and religion, but you're a Buddhist in, 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 in essence because you've come into contact with the Dharma. And I just love that. It was the perfect thing that I wanted to hear, so I just kept practicing. And little by little in this practice, we begin to taste the Dharma. <clears throat> but it's still very much related to the amount of time we practice. You know, if you practice or if you ever have a chance to go on retreat, some of you have, some of you haven't, or maybe in your daily practice, you might start to see deeper insights. You might like to start to see the distinction between uh, mind and matter, really like separate. You, you start to understand when you're seeing things that are physical and mental. You might start to see the connections, the cause and effect. You might start to see the process-oriented consciousness. You might start to experience not the idea of impermanence, like watching a sun go down. You know, when the sun's setting, you're, you're seeing impermanence, but, but actually seeing it more phenomenologically on, you know, how you're watching the breath and just before your eyes, the breath starts to change and it just, you know, different things are happening. You might start to see dukkha directly. You might start to see anatta, things disappearing, things relaxing, things opening up, things expanding. You might begin to have direct experiences of those, of those uh, three universal characteristics and at the beginning they're just little glimpses and tastes but as you practice they they strengthen and they get stronger but if you stop practicing for a few days or for a few weeks or maybe even a few months who knows maybe even a few years you're just busy with other things in life it's gone it's gone you it's just a memory in the past if you practice you can get back there it'll be experienced differently but but you can and you will get back there the practice is a forward leading practice but if you stop practicing, it all kind of falls flat. So um, that's, the, that's the line. That's the struggle between when the practice is still something that we are dependent on the discipline or that we're dependent on the structure or we're dependent on the technique or we're dependent on a teacher or we're dependent like this group here, this beautiful, amazing group of people. When we get together, we somehow rise to being a better human being. This is what, what's Seal saying? I want to be the person that my dog thinks I am. You know, our dog thinks we're like the, the greatest human being in the world, <laughs> but we're not. <laughs> Actually, I'm, I'm not, <laughs> but I'm happy my dog thinks that. <laughs> but when I get together with you people, I'm somehow, yeah, my dog would be proud of me if he sees me the way that I, she, if she saw me the way that I interact in this group, it's like, that's, that's my best. But it's dependent on the group, for example. You know, and then when I go away, I'm like, whatever causing problems or getting in arguments or, you know, bumping into egos and stuff like that. But in this group, it's like, wow, we raised to a higher place, but it's dependent on the group. It's still dependent on something external. And that means it has not yet become internalized. Can, can you raise your hand if you understand what I'm saying? 
That's everybody. I'm going to assume Carl has his hand up and Jerry has his hand up. There it is. <laughs> Good. So I think it's something we all experience. Yeah. There's more. I'm going to, this is part one of what I want to talk about tonight. And I'm going to talk about something else. But what I'd like to do now, put you in a breakout pairs this time for five minutes and let you share where you feel. If you rose your hand, if you rose your hand, that means that you understand what I'm talking about in your, in your own practice. So we put you in pairs and let you share that for a moment with, with each other. Does that sound okay? Yeah, great. So let me just set up the breakouts. We'll give you five minutes to, but I'm going to put you in pairs this time. So just give me a second. Perfect. Okay. So um, where you feel that the practice is still dependent on external forms, it could be a technique, a method, listening to a guided meditation or a group or whatever, and where you feel like you've actually, you're, you're grounded in the practice. Okay. Great. We've got five minutes for that. Enjoy. Okay, everybody, welcome back. I hope you had a good breakout session. Would anybody like to share about this dilemma between, you know, how we, we, we need the practice to keep us in a way on track? And um, if, we, if we don't have the, traffic, the, 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 the practice, we kind of we feel like we fall off the wagon. Anybody want to share something that came up for you? Uh, okay, Matthias, and then we'll go to Stephen. Yeah, Matthias. Yeah, uh, I can just share. We had a, an interesting chat with uh, with Miriam, and perhaps not so much about how we practice on, on our own path, but when we actually meet other paths as well, whether it be in a different style of Aikido, or I was telling a story of how I went with my son to his jiu-jitsu practice and took on the white belt again and trying to sort mm. of meet another style, another idea of how to train, mm. and how hard that is to, to sort of, yeah, find... Uh, both be true to yourself and also to be true to, to the other paths that, that you, uh, that you cross. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And, and, and cause, because there are, there are unifying principles. Absolutely. In, yeah, in yeah. all martial arts. They were but doing the same techniques, but not from the kind of the same. Uh, there you go. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's actually, that's actually a, a beautiful description because, mm -hmm. you know, like if we just look at our Aikido practice, you know, if, if we, when we touch the principles, my experience is at a certain point when I penetrated the principles enough that it, it actually changed my technique. Mm -hmm. it, it just happened automatically. There was a new evolution in the technique. Technique got better as I was more aligned with the principles. Mm -hmm. And um, if I held on to the, the way that I was doing the technique, it would actually block the principles. But if I allowed the principles to come through, it actually changed the technique. And then I understood other styles and other arts much, much. Yeah. First, I had more... Um, I was more humble mm -hmm. when facing other ways of doing things and more um, uh, open-minded. And, um, and I could actually see, I could see that it, yeah, it's, it's, the, the, it's not about the difference of the styles. It's about you know, how aligned are we with the, the principles and, and how much we're, mm -hmm. we're not. That's great. Yeah, thank you, Matisse. Uh, Steve, where's Steve? Oh, I don't see Steve. Oh, there he is, yeah. Hey, Steve, your mic's open. Thank you, Miles. Uh, I have been listening to a few of the a few of the tapes that you've done where you're interviewing people who are very advanced in Aikido, very advanced in meditation. Right. And I've always uh, I have this sort of feeling like there's something that I'm missing that I'm not getting it. But as I listen to them, and I realize they're just as messed up as I am in terms of of meditation how they do what they do and and so on they don't have any great significant answers and then i thought well oh miles is going to rebuke them <laughs> he's going to he's going to jump on them and say are you getting this and are, are, you, are you doing that but you didn't you accepted everything that they were telling you and that that liberated me it made me feel like uh you know I, it's my path. The direction that I go in is what's happening to me and yeah. I'm actively doing. And it may sound like somebody else's, but it's not. And it's acceptable to me. So, you know, I can do with it as I please. And, and, and whatever, whatever my goals are, whatever I'm trying to deal with, uh, my meditation is my meditation. So yeah. it was very liberating. Thank you. Yeah. And even if we, even if you and I do the exact same method technique, it's still going to be different. Right. Because you're unfolding as you're unfolding, my unfolding is my unfolding. 
and yet the unfolding is the same. That's where we were actually alive. And, and that's the principle. And there's like one of the principles that comes out of integral theory is that everybody has a piece of the truth. Nobody's, nobody's smart enough to be 100% wrong about everything. No, everybody has a piece of the truth and all truths are partial. That's the key. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. All right. So, so that, that's cool. So everybody can relate. Ah, Miriam. Yeah. We'll get you on. Yeah. Please. Your mic's um, on. I also just, I just wanted to respond to something you said in response to Matthias. And then when you, when you, because you were reminding us of the principles mm -hmm. and um, while I can relate to that quite, well, in Aikido, I uh, know that my meditation is still very much at the beginning, mm -hmm. but um, rela uh, relating this to meditation, um, I, I'm kind of hopeful that uh, when, like there are, there are, there are um, ways of trying to be truthful to the meditation style, to, to mindfulness that can allow us to get into the practice more easily by um, sticking to the principles, so to say, like being mindful of mm -hmm. which, so, so not, not um, judging what I'm doing during meditation, but rather returning to the, to mindfulness and stuff like that. I, I just, um, just makes me hopeful because actually at the moment I find my meditation very messy, so. Yeah, but, yeah, and and yeah. here's the, here's the thing, because you say you find it messy, and and I'm, I'm, I try, I believe you, and maybe because what I hear from you, I find it's messy, and it's kind of it's kind of lost its. Uh, it was better before, and now it's not as good. That's what I. That's the subtext text that I hear, and it might be true. Yeah. It might be true, but the messiness can also be a sign of progress. It's hard to say. I don't know right now because we'd have to talk about your practice, but that could actually be progress. So mm -hmm. it's a tricky thing. So you say staying true to the principle is with mindfulness, it's the simplest thing in the world. I mean, it's the simplest thing in the whole universe. It's the most difficult thing in the whole universe. Just to be present with what's arising in the present moment as it's unfolding is the path. So messiness is unfolding. Uh, okay. <laughs> be mindful of that. It, 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 and that might, it, it could be that, you know, okay, it fell apart a little bit. That, that does happen. But it could also be that it's moving into new territory and that's just the nature of it. I don't know if you've ever played video games, but, you know, if you play a video game, you kill all the little aliens or something or however you play video games. I don't know how they do it. I, I played, it was a long time ago. They didn't have these things when I was playing. <laughs> But you would get level one and it was so hard and then you'd kill all the aliens and you go to level two and you master that level. You're really good. You go to level two and suddenly it's just overwhelming again. It's a mess, mm -hmm. but that's a developmental step. So there's sometimes we develop into the next level. That's just, it's a new mess. And mm -hmm. the struggle with that level, oh, the, the aliens are too overwhelming. You know, you just try to get one and two and whatever. If I stick with that metaphor, <laughs> Um, it, that's what, that's what it, it strengthens your, your, your internal muscles. And that's actually the, since we're talking about internalization, that's the process of internalization, you know, mm, facing, yeah. facing those, those challenges. So great. Thanks, Miriam. And, you know, and trust the path, <laughs> trust the path as, as, uh, as, as horrible as that sounds sometimes, um, because we go through challenging stuff in the path, but uh, trust it. I was going to go ahead to, to a little bit more teaching, but does anybody else want to share? Because it's nice to hear feedback from the group. Renata. Um, <clears throat> I am practicing Aikido for six years and haven't, well, haven't taken or had that many chances to do that much of it. And nothing about nothing has been internalized by now. And I'm not giving up and not giving in, but that's, I know it's due to the, the amount I do. And then meditation came in addition and I can do more of it. I, I'm not able to go on retreats, but it's every day at last, at least 
-hmm. and it's yeah about half an hour every day so it's and i feel like i've i have it's an internal practice anyway and and i'm at the principles and i've got a great teacher and sangha and it it uh, it works well and i've recognized that this i guess that this is what makes me now better at touching the principles of Aikido too. So I'm very thankful that I, as I am still so much dependent on the actual practice and the techniques and so on, that it kind of um, works together, meditation and Aikido. So that I hope by that, the internalization will go ahead a little bit faster. I feel it's like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. That's great. I mean, it, 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 we can definitely, we can certainly create the conditions for the process of internalization to go. I wouldn't say <clears> go <throat> faster because you can't go faster than it can go. Mm. But we can, we, what we have, a, we have an amazing, our egos have an amazing tendency to delay the process. We're, we're very skilled about delaying it. <laughs> so when you create the conditions, the delays, we delay things less. And then the process is going to unfold as it's going to unfold. It won't go faster than it can, but it won't take longer than it should, if that makes any kind of sense. Great, Renata, thank you so much. All right, so let's carry on about uh, internalizing your practice. So I thought I'd tell I'd share a little story back when I was in Japan. And, and um, you know, what can I say? I was this dear friend of mine. It was a, a senior Aikido practitioner, and this was this was a this person was a teacher. It still is a teacher, in fact. I, I'm just going to avoid the name because I'm just out of respect. But this person also had a deep spiritual practice. It was a, it was a kind of a Hindu practice, and this this person who I highly respect and still highly respect, in fact, um, had did a daily ritual, kind of a Hindu ritual, where they would burn um, uh, dung dung is cow shit you know they would burn it there's a ceremony it's called the fire ceremony where they burn it and they do things with water and it's it's it's, it's, it's beautiful it's a beautiful ceremony even though it's cow shit it's still it's a, it's a, that's what they do in india <laughs> it's a great ceremony and there's a meditation there's some chanting that goes with it the whole thing takes about 40 minutes and it's it's deep meditation and then and i, I highly admired this person as, as i said before i still do but I, I i certainly admire that they would bring the spiritual and the, and the martial together and then one day we went to, we went to Mito, which is a town about half hour away from, from Iwama where I live. And we're taking the train back and we got off the train and my friend, all of my friend's um, paraphernalia ceremony things, the little cup and the bowl and the, and the, and the, and the cow shit, all of it was kept in a blue bag. <laughs> and my friend forgot their blue bag on the train and the train left off. And the moment my friend realized this person completely fell apart. And I, the, the, the good news is it's Japan. Nobody's going to steal your stuff. It's, it's incredibly safe. But it was like, oh my God, it's gone. And like, you know, you would think it was uh, whatever, the end of the world. <laughs> um, and it, it was just, it was just a reminder. And I'm not, I'm, I don't want to come off too judgmental about this person because, you know, we all have our things that we're attached to. But it was very clear where this person's spiritual practice, which was very impressive, and I, and I do mean that, was completely dependent on a bag of cow shit, really. I mean, there was other stuff in there. And it was, you know, stuff from India. And it was, it was precious things uh, in general, but also precious to this person. And when they lost it, which they didn't lose, they ended up getting it back, completely, I mean, tears, the whole thing, like completely fell apart. And, um, and it was just an example of me like, wow, okay, you know, we, we, it's important that we have our external practices, but if we're dependent on those things, when those things shake, we're going to shake. When we're dependent on spirit, when we shake, spirit does not shake. The absolute, the ultimate reality, the Dharma does not shake. That's why it's called the unshakable state. And when we practice to the point where we begin to taste that little by little by little by little by little, what happens is that our egoic reference point, we are all, we are, our, our identities are very much bound in 
in our, uh, our personality, our history, our culture, our family, our preferences, our likes, our dislikes, our heaven, or not heaven, God bless us all, our, our past traumas, our past undigested uh, psychological experiences that we're still working with, our issues and our, our mommy issues, our daddy issues, our sex, drugs, and rock and roll issues, and all of these things that we, that, that's, that's, that's who we are identified as. And then spiritual practice, certainly meditation practice, helps us to kind of relax that first and then experience states beyond the personality. So our, our identity moves from, I'll say ego or personality, to, which is very relative towards spirit, which is absolute. So that shift, that gradual shift can take years. That gradual shift can take decades. That gra gradual shift can take a whole lifetime. In fact, according to the Buddhists, that gradual shift can take lifetimes, several lifetimes. We're going through this process of purification. And um, it's, it's, in one sense, my friend losing uh, their, their blue bag of cow shit was a blessing because it showed this person exactly where they were, were attached, exactly what they were attached to. Um, and I've had, of course, my own experiences uh, uh, in different ways like that. And every time we, get, we have an experience like that, it's, it's just a reminder, okay, this is where I'm still, I'm still working with myself. Um, in Buddhism, there is something, there's, there's something called, the, there's these three trainings as part of the traditional Buddhist teaching. Uh, and the foundation training is the sila, or the uh, ethical ways of living. That's the foundation. That comes before meditation, by the way. Ethical living. You know, don't steal, don't kill, don't lie, don't... Just, basically, there's, there's a list of five things, I won't go into them, but basically it means don't harm other people and don't harm yourself. With your actions, don't harm, a, <coughs> excuse me, don't harm other people and don't harm yourself with your speech. That's what, that's, what, that's what ethical living means. That's what every religion, every philosophical uh, system um, is unified around that, that we have a, a fa the foundation of everything is, is a certain ethical. Love, the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Love thy neighbor, that's the, that's the basic foundation. Then, that's the first training. The second training is the, is the um, uh, Samadhi bhavana, the, the development of, 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 of the mind, development of concentration, development of mindfulness. The third level of training is development of wisdom. The development, the development of concentration is how we move from, from um, external identities to internalizing the practice. And the development of wisdom, the wisdom training is just deepening that, that internalization. That's the process that happens. Now, uh, it's a gradual process that we go through, through since I teach, basically, I use the, the, um, the progressive insight that there's these developmental stages of insight knowledge that unfold in the practice. If you know it, it's cool. If you don't know it, it, it doesn't really matter. You know, you practice, it's happening. It's happening to everybody here. It's already happening. And, and whether you know the map or not, it doesn't really matter. Um, but at certain points along that journey, you have certain experiences, certain special experiences that transform the mind once and forever and for always. It's a gradual path of purification. You're purifying the mind. You know, you're purifying all of our external identities, all of our confused ways of seeing reality. You're purifying that. And then certain experiences happen, very clear experiences, which I won't go into, but they happen. And it brings about a transformation in consciousness. Now, there's something interesting that they say that this first level of, of training, the sila training, or the morality training, the ethical training, um, and you can probably relate to this if you're grown up Christian or Jewish or, 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 or I don't know if anybody here has grown up with Islam, but all of the, or Buddhist, all of the, the, the world's wisdom traditions have a strong moral teaching. All of them. There's no exceptions there. And at the beginning, it's necessary because we, that's what... Uh, well, if I say, if I say, it, I don't want to get into a moral talk, so I'm trying to find a, the, the, the great way, or a uh, skillful way to navigate this. The Buddhists say that um, when you take on moral training, that you raise your standard as a human being. Basically, when you're not hurting other people, you're, you're, you're kind of, a, it's, a, it's a higher standard of humanity, not harming others, not harming yourself. 
when we when you're doing things like you're stealing and cheating and all this other stuff it, it's just kind of more of a basic that level of humanity and i don't want to judge because we all have our stuff that we go through and that we're facing in life and you know whatever past karma etc but when we're able to kind of uh, uh get above that we raise our standards as a human being but that standard is held by moral force so the sila or the morality training is held by moral force it's like we have we all have a super ego inside of our mother or our father telling us be a good boy be a good girl don't do this don't do that there's an angel on this side there's a devil on this side and and the angels are always you know they're struggling with each other and hopefully the angel these days the angel wins more than the devil but <laughs> believe me in the past the devil the devil had his day i can tell you <laughs> so you know we go through this this kind of this struggle and um but our ethical ways of being our ethical living is held by moral force but at a certain point in the practice there's a certain experiences that happen that purify the mind and sila your ethical living no longer is held by moral force but rather it becomes an expression of your awakening so you're no longer you know there's some days you, you get an argument you just you really want to say something like sharp that's going to touch the point, maybe even nasty. And you really want to say it, maybe you say it, another person, you know, you, you kind of win the fight and that, or you, you manage to kind of hold it back, but you're holding it back with moral force. At a certain point in the practice, the mind undertakes the transformation of consciousness, that purification happens where the, this, this ethical, ethical living is no longer held by moral force, but it becomes the expression of your being, the expression of your own awakening. And that's something that happens through the practice. It's a gradual process of happening. You know, you can actually begin to see how the mind becomes more and more purified in the practice. And that is when the practice, and certainly I'm just using the ethical living as an example, but that is how the practice flips into becoming internalized. It's no longer held by an external, external rule or moral force, but it's actually an internal expression of who you are. Are. Now, I had a few different experiences. I mean, I certainly have experienced that, and I certainly have slipped off the moral, the ethical ways of living, you know, on a regular basis, running a business, living in the city, you know, being married and having kids and all that. You know, what are you going to do? Maybe you get in an argument and you say the wrong thing, you feel bad afterwards and all that stuff. But we're, we're, we're doing, you know, we're all doing our process, and we're all doing, you know, we need to forgive ourselves and give ourselves a, a break and keep going. We are all on a path of purification. This is the Visuddhi Maga, the path of purification. Um, but uh, <coughs> the practice will gradually begin to become internalized. One of the ways that I experienced this in, a, in kind of the most beautiful, which I want to share with you, is when um, my teacher, Sairu Pandita, when he died, and um, I knew he was sick. I'd heard he was sick. He was actually sick for about a year or so. And then I got the news that he died. And I just, I just closed my eyes and turned in. And I dropped into the deepest um, meditation, like instantly. I mean, after years of practice, it's not so hard to do that. But still, on a regular day, you know, I got to sit through 15 minutes of my mind calming down or whatever. And then I get there. But this, you know, I just connected with Upandita, my teacher, who is a, a, an incredibly, and just incredibly powerful force in my life. Incredible human being, incredibly powerful. And suddenly I dropped the deepest place. And what I experienced in that moment, I was right there with him. He led me, he guided me in the practice. Not so, uh, what do you say? <laughs> Not so kindly <laughs> many times, but he guided me through my stuff. and got me and, and long until I reached some of the deepest experiences that I've ever had in life and the deepest experiences that can be had in meditation. I'm sure there's deeper, you know, it's not over by any means. Um, but as soon as I, as soon as I got the news that he had passed and I was right there with him, it was, I wasn't, ex I was the, the deepest state that I was experiencing was actually, I don't want to say like I was experiencing Rupandita, but I was actually that's where that's what he was teaching 
That's what he led me to. That's what he expressed it. And, and I was right there with him. And in that moment, he was right there with me. He was not dead. He's still not dead. He left the body. And what he was, and, and you know, and what he was teaching, what his teacher taught, there's a whole lineage that that thing is just, that that, that that deeper state has been passed on. And I realized that there was no sadness. I mean, there was a loss, but there's no sadness. It's like, I don't even have to read his book. I'm, it's just, I just turn in and whoop, and he's there. I'm there. Him and I, we're there together. I, it's not even a me at that point, but I experience that state and I experience him in that moment. And that's where it is completely internalized. And it, it was completely self, um, even though he guided me and, and kicked my butt along the path sometimes. Occasionally he was sweet to me, but he was usually kicking my butt. Um, um, I earned it myself. You know, he, because you can't, you can't, Somebody once said, a wise person just recently said to me from this group uh, that you that nobody nobody can walk the path for you, but you can't do it alone. And that was what it was. You know, it, it, it was self-earned the state, um, and at the same time, it was completely you know I couldn't have done it without without that lineage. So that that, that that's just one example of how that's completely internalized for me forever and always forever and always i don't i don't even see that disappearing in my life i can't i couldn't imagine i can't imagine meditation disappearing in my life but you know um it's possible so before we meditate a little bit um i i, I want to share with you uh, um, a beautiful quote from the buddha straight out of the dhammapada where the buddha says through the practice of meditation wisdom is gained. Without the practice of meditation, wisdom is lost. Understanding these dual paths of gain and loss, would you not choose the path that leads to wisdom? The practice of meditation, wisdom is gained. It's happening. It's happening with all of us. Everybody who sits down to meditate, that process has been activated. The process of wisdom arising in your consciousness through purification of the mind is happening. Through the practice of meditation, wisdom is gained. Without meditation, wisdom is lost. Understanding these dual paths of gain and loss, would you not choose the path that leads to wisdom? And uh, I want to leave you all with, uh, with a, uh, a short story of, of this internalization of the practice. And um, the, the late great teacher, uh, Gurdjieff, um, uh, had a beautiful story called Meetings, a book, and then later was made into a movie called Meetings with Remarkable Men. It was about his own spiritual journey as a young man going and seeking. He, he went out. He went to the exteriors to discover um, the, deeper, the deeper spiritual paths and processes and teachings and techniques and methods and he did everything and along his path after many years he, he met uh, his soul soul brother uh, a very clear dear friend it was, a, it was a it was a former prince from russia russian prince that's what he was called in the story and uh, they were seekers together and they traveled around and met teachers and then one day they were in a cafe a tea shop somewhere in egypt i guess um, and um, a man, just like enlightened being, walked in and walked right up to the Russian prince, and he called him by his childhood name, which nobody knew. Only his mother and his sister called him that, and he called him, and he said, come with me. And it was like, you know, that he knew that this was, this was the, the calling of the teacher, and he was going to take him to the place to whatever, to become enlightened or whatever it was. So Gurdjieff got up to go with him, and, and the guy said, no, no, not you. It's only him. So there was this really sad leaving that they had to, they had to say goodbye to each other. His, his closest friend on the path left. So Gurdjieff went on for many years seeking on his own. And finally, after many years, he found way, you know, it's kind of a very metaphorical story, but way up in the mountains somewhere in, in Azerbaijan or someplace in, the, I don't know, in, in Central Asia, he, he, he found a monastery and he went in and, he, he, and it was an amazing place. They were doing deep practices and he realized that he had found um, he found the place that, that he wanted to be. And after he realized that, he turned he went walked into a room. Who did he find? His his soul brother, uh, the Russian prince. And it just so happened that same very day, the Russian prince was leaving. 
he was an old man by that time. He was going off to die, and that was it. He was going to disappear into heaven. I don't know, but it was it, you know they were just passing each other. He was coming. He was going. And the final words of the movie the, the, were, the, were the words that the Russian prince said to Yerdjeff. It's very much about the internalization of the practice. He said, "You have finally come to the place where you're, the longing of your heart." can become the reality of your being. The longing of the heart is that external, that, that what drives us to find you know, our greater potential. And the reality of that, bring is that being is that realization. He said, you finally came to the place where the longing of your heart has become the reality of your being. And he said, stay here until you have developed a force inside of you that is unshakable. That's the internalization of the practice. He said, then you have to go back to the world where you will be where you will be constantly met with energies that will constantly show you your place. So it's, a, it's totally it's totally beautiful because we you know we go into deeper states of meditation, then we go out and we get up in our daily life, we go out in the world, family, friends, work, whatever, and we're constantly met with energies that constantly show us our place. How internalized is it and how much is it not? Okay, so we get back and we practice. And uh, it's just a beautiful, a beautiful, a beautiful uh, um, story, a beautiful metaphor of, of how our practice is. And we don't have to go to Central Asia to find a monastery that's hidden up in the mountains to do that because that's all inside here. But we do need to, to, to find a place where the, the, the deepest longing of our, of our hearts, and it's, and it's in one way or another, we all express it differently, but it's all the same. We want to heal. We want to become. We want to merge with. Uh, I don't know, the divine eternity, whatever, whatever. We want to become the biggest that we can possibly be. We want to return to our true nature, basically, and um, and then we we need to stay there and practice with it as 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 we've as we've uh, realized that we want to internalize it and develop that internalization and then go back into the world. And meet the forces, and meet meet the energies, and meet the 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 the, 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 the situations in life that will show us our place. And with that, I would like to bring this session to an end. Um, uh, thank you all very much. Um, as you know, uh, this is a uh, this is a great way for us to all kind of come back together. But um, in two weeks, uh, I'm starting the uh, the next the next rounds. Meditation for Aikido. I'm calling it MFA 2020. Um, I'm sure you've all got an email from me already about about joining. Some of you are joining. Some of you may not join. That's totally fine. But but it's really I've I've made it pretty reasonable price for everybody. Uh, it's going to be the same course, but it'll uh, it'll always be different. There's going to be a different community, and I teach slightly different always. The, the, the teachings are evolving, so would love to have you join that. There's going to be one additional. Oh, we also have the, the guest teachers. Um, some of you probably know them. It's going to be Jenny uh, Whitelaw is going to be one of the teachers, Zen Roshi. Also, Dominique Cassidy is going to teach a session. Teja uh, Bell, he's also a Zen Roshi. He's going to teach a session. And Rob Vinken from, from Mindfulness uh, in, in Holland, he's going to be teaching a session. So we have those great guest teachers. And I'm going to be implementing a new aspect to the course, which I still don't know how it's going to go, but we're going to have daily virtual sitting rooms. So it means like day, when I say daily, I mean Monday through Friday. Um, in Europe in the morning and in North America in the morning, we're going to have the, the room open that people can come and sit together for 30 minutes. And there might be somebody in there leading the group just to ring the bell and maybe to answer questions if there's questions. But that'll be open daily. So it's a kind of a new feature that I'm at. And you know, some people like to sit alone, other people like to sit in the group. So um, that we'll, we'll see how that goes this time around. If not, uh, I hope to see you in two weeks. If not, I'll see you around sometime. There's going to be lots of opportunities for us to meet uh, online and offline in the future. And I want to wish you all, as usual, I wish you all a great practice and may your practice continue to internalize forever and all, always internalize until the deepest longing of your heart becomes the reality of your being. Thank you all very much. Yeah, I'll open up the mics. Hang on a second. How do I do that? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much, you. Miles. Thanks, Thanks, Miles. Thanks, Miles. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.